I still remember seeing the Saba tree like it was yesterday. At the time, I was in the middle of my PhD fieldwork in Nicaragua in Central America. And I'd spent most of the day up to that point traipsing around different cocoa cultivation areas, learning from cocoa farmers about their trees, about the cocoa pods that grow generally just above eye level. So my eyes had been fixed to sort of that region roughly. And then suddenly I looked up and I saw this giant majestic tree. And I was told afterwards that the Mayas believed that the Sabre tree actually connected heaven, earth, and world below. And from looking at it, I could certainly believe that. The branches extending into the heavens, the trunk that was solidly holding up the skies, and then the roots reaching far into the soil. And for me, this tree came to symbolize that everything in this world is connected often in ways that I did not anticipate, that I only found out after quite a bit of research. My name is Judith Krauss. I work for the University of Sheffield's Institute for International Development. And this evening, I would like to share with you three short stories, three examples from my own work of how things are connected in ways that we may not foresee and also in ways that we may not be very comfortable with. And the first example comes from my PhD on chocolate. This is generally when people start smiling, their eyes glaze over. Yes, I did actually get to think about chocolate 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years. And I have also brought some chocolate this evening, partly to say thank you very much for sticking it out with all of us until the end, but partly also because experience has taught me the hard way that if you turn up somewhere to talk about chocolate and you don't bring any, that doesn't go over very well. <laughs> so afterwards, please do try those different types of chocolate. But when I was buying these different chocolate bars, what my research has done to me is that I now cannot go to the supermarket till without thinking about where this cocoa has actually come from. Who grew it? Under what circumstances? I found out through my research that generally, for every pound I spend at the supermarket till, only about four or five P will go back to the cocoa farmers who do all the hard work in the hot, blazing sun, living far away from the road that the cooperative passes by only once a week to pick up the cocoa. And if you have, for example, fair trade certification, a little bit more goes back to the farmers for fairer pay for the cocoa, but also for their workers. If you have organic or environmental certification, also a slightly more goes back towards them to encourage them, for example, to plant trees in with their cocoa trees to mitigate climate change, like Suma was talking about earlier or to integrate the cocoa trees better into the general biodiversity ecosystem. But fundamentally, even though I talked to so many cocoa farmers, cooperatives, NGO workers, companies, government workers, all of whom were committed to making cocoa more sustainable, that fundamental imbalance of only a fraction of what I pay going back to the people who do the hard work doesn't really change. It's maybe slightly changed, but not fundamentally. And to me, that is something that I find quite worrying. I cannot generally see from the packaging of most chocolate bars who has grown this cocoa or under what circumstances or how much of what I've paid for it goes back to them. For me, that is quite a troubling connection. It's hidden and to me, it's quite unjust and unsustainable. My second example comes from last year, when I had the chance and the privilege to take a group of master students on fieldwork to Uganda. And for our environment, climate change and development pathway, we chose living with national parks as one of our themes. If that's what you want to think about, Uganda is a great place to do that. Whether you go to the Ugandan Visa and Immigration Services website, whether you're standing in the arrivals terminal at Kampala International Airport, wildlife is everywhere. Elephants, giraffes, Ugandan cobs, which is a type of antelope. The pictures and imagery is beautiful, inviting you to get to know this wonderful country and its wonderful people. <laughs> 
based on the conversations we'd had before leaving, I invited my students to listen very carefully when we were in the national parks for how our tour guides would be speaking about not just the animals, but the people. And the answer, sadly, is that generally, they don't really talk that much about the people who used to live on the land, who were then moved out to create space for the national park, nor about the people who live around the park, but are adversely affected by either their livelihoods being restricted from no longer being allowed to enter the park, or the wildlife from the park affecting them by, for example, going to uh, raid their crops. And we actually had the opportunity to speak to those hardworking, resilient communities about their experience. And they told us how frustrating it can be when you've got your livelihood that you've worked for for such a long time raided just overnight. Or sometimes even worse, when there's loss of life as a result of, for example, elephants coming out of the national park. Don't get me wrong, I think elephants are great unless you happen to live next to them. I do fundamentally believe in protecting nature and protecting these species, like many of my colleagues have spoken about this evening. The tourists that I've spoken to, who've visited national parks since coming back, many of them either admitted to not really thinking about people at all, because they weren't really encouraged to by their tour guides, or where they did think about people around the national parks they'd visited, they just assumed that part of the money they'd paid to get into the national park would benefit the communities living around them. But what happens if 60 or 70 percent of the park budget that partly comes from what you pay to get into the park actually goes towards keeping people out of the park as opposed to compensating the communities whose livelihoods or lives have been adversely affected by the wildlife coming out of the park. That doesn't seem like the right way to protect nature, surely. And in, in relation to that, you've got tourists who are establishing connections with those Ugandan communities, even though they may not even know there is a connection, and they definitely don't know about what a problematic and arguably unjust and unsustainable connection they are establishing. <coughs> My third example comes from some recent work I've been doing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Some of you may have heard of them. They sound like a fabulous idea. Agreed in 2015, 17 goals that will solve people, planet and prosperity all at the same time eliminating poverty, promoting gender equality, safeguarding decent work, fighting climate change, they sound great. But the problem is, when you start digging deeper, you start uncovering some problematic structures. There's one goal, for example, that's dedicated towards biodiversity conservation. The problem with that goal is that it's all about expanding protection, expanding national parks. Now, we just talked about how, in regards to the Ugandan communities, doing that without any consideration for the people who live around that park or who used to live on the land or whose livelihoods are affected or lives are affected, that's deeply problematic. But that's exactly what that goal does. The same way the goal that fights climate change. You will very rarely hear that reference by Youth Strike for Climate, for example. And there's, I think, a very good reason for that, which is that this goal, in much the same way as the conservation goal, thinks about climate change in isolation. We talked earlier about how if you pay cocoa farmers a little bit extra, they can start, for example, planting cocoa trees alongside other trees to sequester carbon. But that goal does not think about the links between climate change and sustainable production and consumption or economic growth, which arguably is very important to fight the roots of climate change. So the way that those goals are structured, in my view, not just hides these connections from view, but I think they, it even exacerbates them because these unjust, unsustainable, unfair connections, if they're not addressed, they are exacerbated and made worse in the process. So where does that leave us? 
If the Seba tree is right and everything is connected, the cocoa farmers with consumers, the Ugandan communities with tourists, the social, ecological and economic parts of the sustainable development goals. So what does that mean then? Since I'm a sad academic, when I don't understand stuff, I start reading a lot. And in that process, I came across some work that was done by Ivan Illich and colleagues in Cuernacava in Mexico on conviviality. That sounds like a big word. Basically what it means is living with or living together. So when you make a choice, you think about what that means, not just for yourself, but for the people around you, for people elsewhere, and for the broader environment. Freedom and responsible interdependence is how they phrase that. There are a lot of connections between that and the idea of Ubuntu, which comes from the South African Nguni people. And that idea is, I am because you are. And that's part of the reason why I am here this evening. Because in trying to be a responsible researcher, I wanted to share those connections with all of you. Not because I've got all the answers, far from it, but because I would like to invite all of you to ask those questions with me. So wherever you're placed, in your families, in your communities, in your organizations, ask what connections are there with people around you, with people elsewhere, and with the environment? Do those connections reflect the kinds of values around justice, fairness, sustainability that you would like to see reflected? And if not, what can all of us do to change that? Thank you.